I always put so much pressure on myself to do this correctly. You know what, Ethan? Forget it. We're starting the episode right now. This is episode 45 of the Grunge Bible Podcast. Here we are. How are you today? Chris, I'm doing I'm doing really well. Um, last week at this time when we recorded, I was a, a faceless man. You and, were, uh, in the words of Scott Stapp. I have great news for everybody, and it's that I got my mother flipping account back, my personal account. I am the king. Of, I'm, I'm the king again. I sit upon the cat of the throne, and um, I actually had a really interesting encounter. So Instagram did a good work today, or a good work in the last week, where they kind of heard the request, and you know, I kind of knew that it was going to be. It should be pretty easy. They probably get hackers all the time. So oh, all the time, you just take a nice, you know, selfie video. You know, they recognize it with the the profile pictures and maybe even some location services and you know they were able to verify and um and then i went in and cleaned house on all the uh two-factor stuff and got that got that rat out of my account so i'm back yeah that was great um yeah i've just been on such a much better wave than i was last you know last time i was crashing into the I was crashing into the side of the, the bank last week, but now I'm riding the wave, and it feels good. I feel yeah. good to be I'm back, Chris. Shit, Absolutely. Shit, Ethan, I'm it's, back. <laughs> Ethan, it's great to have you back. Um, it's great to have you back on the waves. Uh, I'm right right out there with you, man. You know. Yeah, you surfing? How you feeling? Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. Um, it's funny. We were talking about uh, about this before we, we hit record here uh, for this episode, and you know, some some days you go to work. Some days you sit down to do a podcast, and you know you have to do it. It's it's an obligation at times. But Ethan, I'm I'm pretty jazzed up to record right now. Dude, so am I. Um, so for the for this episode, we decided to choose uh, another album, and we wanted to show some love to Nirvana and Kurt Cobain. So we decided we're going to be talking about In Utero today, and I I would totally agree with you, Chris. Today I was listening to the album out on the job. And I got excited. I got really excited. I haven't gave In Utero a good listen um, like this front to back um, the way I did. And I mean, we're going to get into it a little bit more, but I think something about me being outside and, you know, picking up sticks and logs and shit uh, that helps helps with whenever I listen to grunge. I, I just love it. I can, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited, too. There's a lot of good, a lot of great songs, a lot of great uh, stories and lyrics. So we're going to have a lot of fun doing that. <clears throat> no doubt. Yeah. I, I totally agree. You know, there there is a lot to this record. Uh, there's a lot to the story around it, as there is to pretty much all parts of Nirvana. And uh, I think I've I've discussed it certainly at least a few times on on preceding episodes. But Nirvana has never been one of the bands that I'll go to, um, you know, of my own accord frequently. Uh, right. Much less it's it's not really a band that I will put on an album front to back and just listen. But today. Today I did that, and and out of all of Nirvana's albums, you know this is this is my favorite one, and it's funny, you know, it's, I've thought of it as my favorite album from Nirvana for a while, but um, kind of listening to it today, it, it kind of it kind of comes through in a different way, and and you you notice different things, and that's the cool part, you know, it's uh you know it's gonna be 28 years old this fall, and it's still you know you still can pick out different things, and you can still. Um, notice different things as you listen. So that's super awesome, and I'm excited to talk about it with you, share some of the things I notice, some of the things I like, and uh, excited for everyone to come along on the on the ride. Yeah, it's fun to be, uh, you know, it's fun to be jazzed up about about talking and and doing this. So this is exactly what we're aiming for. We're re- we're revitalized, and you know why, Chris? Why is that? Because we got a league of support behind us. We got a league of supporters in the Patreon, and we're. Dude, we're knocking them down, dude. These guys are killing it. We got new patrons. We got two new people we get to talk about. We got, dude. If you're not, if you're not a part of the Patreon that we have, the patrons, the boat is filling up. The boat is filling up, and you, you gotta, dude. Shitty cup of coffee, two dollars a month, five dollars, ten dollars a month. If you love what we do, dude, get a, get on board, dude, because we're about to take off. We're a rocket ship, and and it's awesome, you know. Yeah, we are we are prepared for liftoff uh, on the launching pad, and uh, as you said, we get to ring the bell twice this week as uh, yeah. we do have two new patrons. Uh, we have at the top level, we have Doug Endy joining us here. Let's go! So top, we're really excited level, about baby. that. Uh, Doug sent us a nice message, um, you know, just kind of explaining to us, you know, what what he likes about the page, and uh, you know, we're really really love hearing that. I know we say that all the time, but it's always it's interesting to kind of get inside everyone's head and. Um, 
just kind of understand why people are finding value in what we're doing. I, I think no matter what you do, um, professionally, recreationally, or whatever, oftentimes you're your own biggest critic. And I know for me, sometimes I, I don't understand that there's maybe value in what we're doing, but it feels yeah. really good. So we appreciate you, Doug, for coming aboard uh, yeah, and at I the noticed, top level. I was going to say for two things about that. One, I really uh, he, he said that he remembers conversations that he had 30 years ago about these albums. And I thought about that for a second, and I, I just pictured you know, him at our age, at, you know, early 20s, um, talking about these albums like we do with uh, albums when they came out. And um, I don't know, it kind of reminded me like that's, you know, that's what we love about the page is we get to cross generations. And so I got I got shot back into thinking about uh, what, it, what it would be like, you know, yeah, talking, well, talking, cool over, talking over these albums when they came out. And yeah, that, that was and, awesome. And it's funny because, you know, that's the staying power of music. I mean, we we're, theoretically, we're going to have the same conversation today that, you know, two 20-somethings did back in 93 when this thing came out. Like, hey, did you know this is about this song or this <clears throat> lyric's really fucking cool or this got me thinking. So um, it's really cool to hear from you, Doug. And uh, it's it's very, you know, we're very grateful to have your support. So, Doug, Yes. And I was also going to say, he also said that he's starting from the beginning. So he's he's backlogging he's all the, the episodes, archives, which is cool. And I love to I love to know that people are doing that. I mean, it's kind of it kind of exposes us maybe our first 10 episodes. But I love that people are going back to listen. I think that's so cool. Absolutely. You know, we got a body of work, Chris. What yeah, episode this is, is this? This is fun. You know, we're coming up on a year. Seven weeks, seven weeks from now, we'll be hitting <laughs> that is, year anniversary. This is episode 45, right? 45. 45 people. That's a lot of ammunition. Um, so Doug Doug is joining our other top-level patrons who we love to thank every week, and their names are Wayne Staley, Rachel Corning, Bubby, Millie, Alexis Shannon, Fuck Soup, Fuck Soup still, hate that shit, Jamie Lynn, <laughs> Kayla Jean, our number one fan from Australia, Marianne, Laura and Irene, Shannon Gorgon, Sue, Sonny Mashburn, Victor Schaefer, Release, and Jade Mercado. And as we spoke about before we made this announcement, we do have two individuals who are joining on the Patreon this week, and uh, one of them has decided to purchase their shitty cup of coffee, and that is Caitlin Warwick. So, Caitlin, thank you so much for joining. Uh, I look forward to hopefully hearing you know, what made you join up and uh, what you like about this show. But um, to Caitlin, Doug, and the other 32 patrons that we have at this point, thanks so much. It's amazing. It's uh, so fun uh, to think about. And man, it's cool. You know, it's really cool. So let's give the people what they want. And that's an awesome Grunge Bible podcast episode about in utero. Let's do this, Chris. You ready? In utero. Let's let's fucking do it. Let's let's, let's do knock this. it down. Where should we start? Do we have some uh, do we have some back some back history? Or whatever, some some stories. Is there any myth? Is there any legend to this? As a matter of fact, we do. I'm so glad you asked that, Ethan. There is there is quite well, the know, backstory to. I know you. Utero. I know you got a you got a vault back in there of all the uh, of all the special stories with these albums. So I'm I'm ready. Absolutely. So <laughs> in the beginning, uh, well, no, not 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 really. But In Utero was released on September the 13th, 1993. Uh, as some of us may know, this was Nirvana's uh, third. Uh, studio album that was released uh, obviously bleach was the the entry into that world and then nevermind changed the music world in 1991 uh, and obviously when you skyrocket to the top like that there's a lot of expectations there's a lot of pressure from different areas and everybody wanted a new nirvana album probably from the day after nevermind came out in 1991 but as we know, if we can do math, if my math is correct, it was over two years until In Utero came out, and there was a lot of different reasons as to why that happened. Um, you know, the band they were they were touring quite a bit in 1992. Um, they were all living in different areas at the time. You know, Kurt Kurt had gotten married, and and he was about to have his first child with Courtney Love, and you know, there's just a lot of different pressures going on, and I think. You know something that's common with all of these bands but particularly i would say kurt and eddie vetter is kind of grappling with fame and what their direction wants to be in what their perception is and just kind of what type of music they want to make so you know nirvana nirvana comes out with nevermind in 91 that changes the music landscape alternative rock is never the same grunge rock becomes a thing and over time kurt he doesn't want to do that again so you know, Kurt said once, "I'd rather die than do another Nevermind." So, at you know, at the time, Geffen Records, who they were signed to, they were like, "We need another Nevermind, and we need right. it now," because they yeah. they just want to they just want to pig the money and just bankroll off of this band. So, 
Um, if we know something about Kurt Cobain, it's that you know he was not the most fond of that type of uh, that type of enterprise there. So what what he and the band wanted to do was they wanted to uh, kind of get into the studio with a different producer and kind of go for a completely different sound that wasn't nearly as polished as they felt that um, Nevermind had been. So. You know, throughout 1992 and early 1993, there were a lot of rumors as to who they were going to go in the studio with as a producer. I mean, it's like the modern day equivalent of trying to find out who Pete Davidson is dating. I mean, there are rumors all the time, like, who's it going to be? Is it going to be Jack and Dino? Are they going to go back around with Butch Vig? Like, what's going to happen? Me? Is it going to be you, Ethan? Are you going to go back in time? And, ah, and they said, date Pete Davidson. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, you're in the running. I guess we're all in the running, right? No one's safe. No one is safe. So um, what they decided to do after after a long time was they decided to proposition Steve Albini as coming on as the producer. Now, Steve was a well-traveled producer, uh, indie rock player, and he was well-regarded in the indie rock scene. I believe he did a lot of work in Chicago. But the interesting thing, I was able to find some quotes as to what Mr. Albini thought of Nirvana. And... He's on record as saying that Nirvana was basically, and I quote, R.E.M. with a fuzz box. R.E.M.? Yeah, so he's casting aspersions at this band before he worked with them. And he also called them an unremarkable version of the Seattle Sound. So I think that means that Steve Albini was a Mudhoney fan. It has to be. Yeah, it Do you think that Kurt saw all those comments and was like, "We need to that." This is even more reason why he needs to produce our. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like I don't, I don't want to work with people that like me. I want to work with people that fucking hate me. Um, yeah. But you know, after a little bit of back and forth, um, I guess Steve agreed to come on. And you know, Geffen had really, really, really wanted Nirvana get in the studio in 1992 so they could have an album to come out for the holiday season in 1992. But As we mentioned before, just with everything going on, that didn't happen. So it wasn't until February of 1993 that they went into the studio. And they went to a little studio in Cannon Falls, Minnesota, and just holed up there and banged this sucker out with Steve Albini. Now, the interesting thing, uh, I think Chris Chris Novoselic is on record as kind of explaining that situation as feeling like a gulag. Like there was nobody in or out. They were snowed in. There was nothing they could do except work. They didn't leave the house. They just worked. Nobody in or out. And and this was kind of, uh, from what I gather, a strategy from Steve Albini that, you know, there weren't going to be a lot of people there. Um, Courtney Love was not supposed to be there for any portion of it. And he, as producer, was just going to listen to the band members and the band members alone. Another good quote that I found from Steve Albini is he, <laughs> the reason that he did this is because he felt that everyone else who was associated with Nirvana that wasn't the band was, quote, the biggest pieces of shit I'd ever met. <laughs> so I don't know if he's referring to Courtney Love or if he's referring to, you know, whoever, but, you know, that's where wow. the chips fell. Yeah, so that's that's the basically what, Exactly. It's it's unbelievable. <laughs> so, you know, they went in, in February of 1993 and they cut the album. Uh, you know, they had, a, they had a lot of songwriting done from that point and they were able to pretty much get everything done in a short time span for Nirvana. Um, I think Steve Albini mixed the thing in you know, five or six days. And, you know, as, as the indie rock producer, he was used to turning things around in like one or two days. Um, so this kind of felt like a long slog for him, I think. But uh, for Nirvana, it was a pretty expedited uh, journey here. Um, so they came out and um, they didn't they didn't include Geffen or um, any of DGC Records' A&R people in the process at all. When they finished up, they sent the masters to Geffen. And Geffen fucking hated it because they wanted another nevermind yeah they didn't want in utero they wanted no Nevermind. it was it was not for them they were like what the fuck man this isn't gonna sell and and there's a lot the on raw, record they, yeah. yeah and there's a lot on record about kurt you know wanting to basically give the middle finger to nevermind and do something that was completely different and and he spoke a lot about the time you know of, of trying to craft it as something that he would listen to at home and i think you know Nevermind blew up. It was everywhere. So he kind of wanted to take a step back and, you know, go in a different direction. I don't know if it was just the contrarian in him or what it's like to have, you know, something that you put out that you're not particularly, you know, overly pumped about, you know, as time goes on and having it just be absolutely everywhere. So that's basically what happened there. But the problem was the story does not end there. So Steve Mm -hmm. Albini comes in, produces, he mixes everything. Uh, Geffen hates it, but, you know, 
this is the record that they got from Nirvana, so this is what they're going to have to roll with. But over time, in mid-1993, the band became a little bit unhappy with a lot of the mixing. Um, and you, you can read more about this you know, pretty much everywhere because it was a highly publicized thing. And the band and Kurt, they wanted to get another producer into the mix and remix a couple of the songs. Steve Albini felt a little betrayed by this. He didn't want to give up the masters to another producer to mix them and after a whole lot of back and forth eventually he agreed to and they ended up teaming up with Scott Litt to re-record or remix rather uh, a couple of the songs from the album most notably the singles Heart Shaped Box and All Apologies as well as Penny Royalty um, so that process happened and then we fast forward to 19 to September 13th of 1993 and In Utero comes out now as we know, there's a little bit more to this as well. Um, Nevermind, as we know, was a huge thing. And Kurt didn't really want to do the whole publicity thing for this thing. He just wanted to put it out. And he wanted to do it on vinyl. So I think on the 13th, uh, it came out in the United Kingdom. And then on the 14th of September, it came out in the United States. And I think they pressed 25,000 vinyl copies of it, actually, as, 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 as part of the initial release. Um, and this is something that I struggle to relate to here. But there was a big controversy because Walmart and Kmart, you know, the, the titans of of the world at the time i would imagine uh they didn't carry this record in their stores they didn't want yeah. anything to do with it um they had said at the time that it didn't align with what products they wanted to have in their stores because of they didn't think it would sell or whatever but <clears throat> over time it, it, it came out basically that um they didn't want to carry it because of the song rape me and yeah. the original album artwork on the rear of the album featured a bunch of uh fetus diagrams as we know kurt was uh you know largely fascinated with you know that type of that type of thing so after a lot of back and forth um the band decided i think in late 93 early 94 to release an additional version with an edited uh rear cover on the album and then the funniest thing <laughs> on the packaging for the Kmart and the Walmart copies, they changed Rape Me on the back on the track listing to Waif Me. So they didn't, they didn't Waif Me, W A I F. Yeah. So that, I, I don't think that's a word. Um, yeah. It's, I don't think it's a word, but that's what they decided to do. Um, and they had said that, you know, they, they wanted to do that to provide the opportunity for people that didn't have access to smaller record stores or whatever um, the opportunity to purchase this album. Um, so it's, you know, like oh, most things with Nirvana, there's it wasn't without controversy and it wasn't without a lot of twists and turns, but eventually this record comes out. I just looked up a waif is a homeless, neglected, or abandoned person. So I guess really? it's a word. Well, yeah, waif you know. me. I don't know, but yeah, well, Kmart's out of business, so they fucked up, basically. I think they're still in business, Ethan, actually. What? Yeah, it's like, um, Wait, yeah. Kmart still... definitely went out of business. Was that not Kmart, like, seven, like when we were in high school? I th I think there's still a couple of locations out there. We'll have to f we'll, ha we'll have to <laughs> fact check this and get back in episode 46. And, uh, Shit. you know, I don't know, because they were going under when we were kids. Yeah, I was say I'm I'm looking Kmart up, but that, anyway, anyway, not, not, this is not about Kmart. We're gonna become um, Kmart truthers. Wow. Um, yeah, that's a lot. There's so and, you know, and I don't know how much out um, how many of the listeners know all of the. You know, it's really interesting when you get into the producing side of it and the record label side of these albums and how you know involved or not involved. Um, each party wanted them to be, you know, how, right. how, how, I guess, picky Nirvana and Kurt was with who they worked with or who mixed it and then making these switches. Like, um, you know, and it's a big, I mean, it's big, it's especially as an artist, like those, those decisions, um, how it's produced and how it's distributed is, is, I mean, says a lot about, you know, your art and your music. Yeah. And, um, and the funny thing for me, Ethan, is, you know, I'm not a industry person. I'm not a musician. I, I don't work in the music industry in any capacity. And, you know, as a casual music fan for most of my life and, and you know, lately the last, you know, five years as I've gotten more into music, it, it kind of never occurred to me before then 
just how involved that process is and how much of a component that process is and how, you know, it's, it's like, it's 50% of the process. Like it's not as simple for some reason. I had this idea that, you know, the band wants to record, they go into a studio, somebody's a yes man for them. They record it and boom, that's the Mm -hmm. record. Then it's out. But there's so many competing interests there. And, and, you know, oftentimes these interests are directly at odds with one another. I mean, Geffen just wants to bankroll this thing and sell a million copies in the first week. And Kurt doesn't want any part with, with, with releasing a, record that sounds just like something he already did and i you know like i said i'm not a musician but i can definitely appreciate that and understand that i mean you don't want to be doing the same things for your entire life no and it's just like i mean it's just like live performances like they you know they mix stuff live and they produce the sounds and and then they have like live recording there's a lot of stuff that goes into that too so it, it definitely needs that side of you know you need more than just the people in the band some you know to make the final product and yeah it's a it's a tough sometimes it can be a very tough battle for sure yeah and it's and it's really interesting just how consistent i think kurt and and nirvana were with a lot of their decision making both musically and in kind of release strategy and things and and after reading about it today and listening to it it kind of you know, more and more strikes me as, you know, the anti nevermind. I mean, even with, with the with the release of the singles, so Heart Shaped Box came out as a single on August thirtieth of nineteen ninety three. So, you know, a little bit before, a couple of weeks before that the album came out. But they didn't release it to any big top forty stations. It was basically just sent out to a lot of college uh, college radio stations around the country. Um so, you know, that's that's another element of that. It's like they're not in it to, you know, sell a million copies in the first week. They're just out to put something out that they like and something that they hope their fans will like. Um, so, you know, it all started with Heart Shaped yeah. Box in August. And then, you know, the album was released in September. And then we have a split single in December of 1993, which was All Apologies and Rape Me came out. Uh, and then they had planned to do Penny Royalty as a single in April of 1994, um, but as we know, you know, Kurt passed away on April 5th of 1994. So, uh, that changed the release of the, you know, the third single that never happened during that time. And additionally, it impacted the in utero tour. Uh, they went on, they went on the road to the United States in late 1993. They played all through the end of the year. And then in the early part of 1994 in February, they had planned to do a, a six week run in Europe, uh, which was cut short, I believe after Kurt had overdosed in Rome, I think in, in March of 1994. Then as we know, he came home, he went to rehab, he left, and then, you know, he passed away in April. So there's in a weird way, you know, there's a lot of this story that wasn't, you know, wasn't finished in the way that I think a lot of people had intended to, um, Mm -hmm. intended to see it through. And that's always something strange to think about, you know, what, what could have been, uh, both musically performance wise and, you know, most importantly, what could have been for Kurt, you know, as, as he passed away at such a young age. Yeah, that's. Yeah, there's so much. Um, there's so much story after this album, and this. I mean, yeah, this was for all intents and purposes the last album that they released, other than like the MTV Unplugged. Uh, correct, I think that obviously yeah. came out after. And you know, this is. Um, it is interesting to think about. I was people talk about a lot how, the death of of Kurt would have would affected their legacy but I, you know I wonder how it affected this album specifically is it the last one it, it aged a lot differently you know it didn't have time to necessarily you know settle for you know yeah that third you know that third single had to be changed the the tour had to be changed and there wasn't kind of the life of the way an album usually um you know gets received where you have a whole year of kind of touring and talking and and it kind of changed the focus on it so um, cause you know, I, I think a lot of people would, I mean, a lot of people probably say nevermind is their favorite album. Totally. Um, and I, I think this was a good question of maybe asking somebody that was there when it happened, um, to kind of see how, how, yeah, the circumstances kind of, ch- if it did change any opinion on the album and if they could even identify those changes. You know? Yeah, exactly. And, and I know we've spoken about this on a prior episode, but I mean, this album was, what just over half a year old when when Kurt Cobain passed right. away and yeah. and and you know whether you like it or not you know someone's passing especially when it's you know unexpected the way that Kurt's was it definitely changes perspectives and reception of of their body of work I think a lot of times we always see a bump in sales uh, and kind of you know we view things in not a more positive light but just. It, 
it just matters more because you know they're not coming out with any more music so it like you said it's really interesting you know we don't have that perspective we weren't alive when this happened you know and when I think of in utero, I just think of it as, you know, Nirvana wanted to do something different. And this this was the next step in their natural progression. So I don't know, you know, what it was like. Was it this, this big A-bomb that's like Nirvana is changing the game. They're changing yeah. their sound. They're not the same band that they were a year or two ago. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so um, when I was listening to it today, um, you know, I was thinking about some of this stuff and I was and I was listening to it as a whole and. And I was like, "What is what is my general reaction to the album?" And um, you know, I, this is uh, such a good album. And you know, it starts off with "Serve the Servants," which I love. One of my favorite documented, one of my favorite songs. And and "Sentless Apprentice" is number two. And yeah. those two songs, and and definitely the way they recorded, um, the way that it was done, it has this very, um, it says this very open sound to the whole. The album is very open. It's very kind of bare bones the drums and everything cu- everything cuts through it's like yeah it's, it's abrasive like like a, in a little way you know 100 percent. yeah there's like a lot of space there's a lot of air but then there's a lot of noise and obviously it meshes really well together and it's just it's kind of you know it's like you know the the emo music um for um you know a little more punky and but it's also kind of like that poppy it's oh dude it's so good and it, it, i think like I said, there's a lot of air, but it's very it, it cuts every all the instruments and the vocals cut through on every song in a way. Yeah, they certainly do. And and you know, speaking of serve the servants, as as you said, that's the first song on this album. So I always think of you know back in the day, if if you got a CD copy or whatever, and you popped it in, and the first line that you hear Kurt Cobain say is "Teenage ang- angst has paid off." Well, now I'm bored and old. And that really relates to, I think, a lot of the struggle and the controversy and the process of putting this album out. I mean, everybody wanted Kurt to be what he was on Nevermind. And, yeah. you know, that song and that opening lyric really makes me think of a statement that he made in a 1992 Rolling Stone interview. It's a fairly popular quote of his, and it's something to the effect of, I don't blame you know, a, a teenage kid for calling me a sellout. And maybe when they'll get older, they'll realize that there's more to life than living out your rock and roll identity mm-hmm. so righteously. Yeah. And I think that's a big theme on this album. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot alluding to things are different and a lot of the same things don't do it for me anymore. And a lot of what w- might do it for you doesn't do it for me. Um, and, and that's something that as I listen to this front to back, you know, it pops out, quite literally in some songs like serve the servants dumb and all apologies and you can just kind of hear it they're they're reaching for something different all throughout this mm-hmm. album musically and lyrically yeah and you know just just you talking about that i mean this is obviously something that we talk about a lot um how bands age and they change and I would have one thing that now that I'm just talking about it, it would be really cool to see if Nirvana would have lasted 25 years how they played their old, their old stuff you know you don't know what the catalog would be but would yeah. they even play would like I feel like they would just be like no we don't play smells like teen spirit we're never playing it again and they were just like you know and they probably maybe they had a like Kurt would be like this is the last time we play this song ever and then he would never play it again like yeah. how they how he would play the old stuff right. that would have been a cool kind of um you know yeah, cool and there's a see. few instances of that happening. I think, if I remember correctly, Radiohead doesn't really play a lot of their old stuff anymore. And quite famously, Robert Plant is on record of saying yeah. that he will never sing Stairway ever again. Like, he just won't do it because the song is old and it's just tiresome. You know, that's all anybody wanted to hear. And I I would imagine no that stairway, Kurt dude. would have taken a similar a similar path. He's like, fuck yeah. no, I'm not playing Teen Spirit. Like, if you wanted to hear that, you should have come and seen us in 1992 yeah <clears throat> yeah um yeah geez so the, honestly these these first four five, actually five six yeah the first six songs are all bangers you know, really. side one of this thing is just i mean they're coming they're coming at you they're yeah. punching you in the mouth they, they're so, loud and they're just telling you that things are different i really love serve the servants i, I think i've talked about it but um this is one of the songs that we played with uh me and andy and uh few of the other guys and it's such a it's such a really f- groovy drum beat i really like i really and the bass and you know guitar it's just it's it has a really nice groove to it so it's fun to play 
Um, but a, a heart shaped box, I, I honestly, it's. I mean, well, I mean, it's no surprise to how good it is. But man, right. I was listening to it, and it is like I was. I was. It's so. Uh, the lyrics have obviously. They're very well written. <laughs> you know, it's it's such mm-hmm. a it's such a poignant and very, um, I don't know, specific song. Um, and the way he talks about it, I think the way he talks about being in a relationship with, you know, a lady and, and how that, you know, it, there's a few different, I guess, interpretations of how the lyrics go. But I found, I've, you know, I think those explanations of of just, yeah, being in a, in a relationship, it's such a, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a good, it's a good representation in a lot of ways. He does, like, he does such a good job with his words, like when he wants to, like he's, he's very well thought out in a lot of ways. Yeah. And this is another prime example of something that we were speaking about a few weeks ago where you can listen to a song and it can affect you and it can have this message to you, but it's so hard to explain that message. It's like what we were saying mm-hmm. where it's like, Ethan, I get it. I can't say it, but I know what you mean. And I know, you know what I mean. And and I feel, mm-hmm. I feel that way a lot when it comes to Kurt's lyrics and, and what he was trying to say. You know, when it comes to this one, you know, for me, Serve the Servant sounds like a Nirvana song. I think Scentless Apprentice is the first song that signals to me that this album is going to be different. But for me, without having that ability to have heard it at the time, I think it's very different. Like I said earlier, when you're doing a postmortem on this thing, you know, 25, 30 years later, Heart Shaped Box sounds like a Nirvana song for me. So I, I'd be really interested to hear people's opinions and their thoughts where if they could call back to that time was it really something different and you know how groundbreaking and how much of a shift change was it because for me you know heart shape box like was probably yeah. one of the first nirvana songs that i heard 100%. because it's one of their most popular yeah yeah i totally i mean absolutely it's just like when new when new bands have a new album and you don't know which songs are going to stick and be their best you know be their best song you never know in, in, a, in a career what album is going to stick the best and yeah that one you know it's, you know their third one of their last albums but yeah heart shape i mean a lot of great songs and then you know for number four rate me obviously very controversial but um really a great um rock and roll song it's such it has such a build and such a such a just a you know, pounding killer finish. And, you know, he hangs on the last note a lot of times and just very, you know, it's just, it's such a good live performing, uh, performing song and obviously very controversial and, and kind of misinterpreted a lot of the times. Um, but is, you know, just a, a really great rock and roll song. Yeah, yeah simply, definitely. Simply and, put. And- yeah, and, and it's interesting because this is another one that I hear and I think that it sounds like a Nirvana song. I mean, it's got those, you know, the, that, that open chord strumming at the beginning and it's got that heavy chorus. And in terms of the subject matter, you know, I mean, Kurt had, they had asked him almost incessantly around this time, you know, what's it about? Like, are you promoting this, you know, or what's going on? And he was like, how obvious do I have to make it that this is an anti-rape song? You know, I made it so incredibly obvious. But, you know, Kurt, Kurt I think... I, th- I think at points it seems like it was a conscious decision to be enigmatic and to be, you know, to create this kind of mystique about him. And, and I think a lot of it comes out in his songwriting, you know, particularly maybe with something like this, um, you know, and it's really interesting to think about. And it's not it's not ever an easy topic to talk about. And it's not ever an easy topic, I think, to talk about artistically. Um, just because, you know, when you're putting something out there, particularly with music, it can be interpreted in all kinds of different ways. So, you know, I mean, I think if a band releases, re- were, were to release this song here in 2022, I think it would be just as controversial. But at the same time, Chris, there is the way that people, because Kurt, I mean, this is like groundbreaking in a lot of ways. And what he, a lot of the stuff he did was really groundbreaking. And I think that, I mean, I just started like some of the shows on TV, some of the stuff that is shown and, I mean, it's pretty. It's you know, it's they're they're really pushing the lines and, and going past a lot of lines nowadays. And um, well, that's another and thing that's that what I Kurt forget did, you know, too. Kurt, yeah, like I mean, Kurt was at the front of this, and I think that I don't know. It, it would be because there's a lot. There's a lot of songs. <laughs> there's a lot of song way worse, way worse lyrics out there, and um, with less, you know, with less backing and meaning behind it. So it would be interesting if it came out today. It's. Uh, maybe you know if it can't. Like, I'm trying to think of a rock band. You know, rock's in a weird spot right now in the world. But 
I mean, right. There's a lot of pop stars and, and a lot of singers talking about different stuff. I mean, I just started watching, I mean, shoot, I started watching Euphoria for the first time, a TV show that's tr- you know, it's trending right now. And it's like yeah. extreme. It's like, I can't believe, it's really, it, you know, it's almost sad that it's trending right now, no matter what they're, you know, if it's trying to bring awareness to a certain thing, it's like not, almost not good. It's too, it's too much. Um, so it, it would be interesting how it would be, um, you know, if it was, you know, the landscape is so different, it, it's hard to really parallel it to any song. Yeah, because, um, the, you know, this is like one of the, the first of that era, the first kind of, you know, mainstream, you know, conversation propositions about something like that. I mean, I think of that and, and sex type thing by Stone Temple Pilots, yeah. you know, and talking before, about this type of subject matter. It's before, you know, you know, and the the law and order side of it like how how those cases were handled versus today like and all of that dynamic right. I mean, is that's so like 25 different. years before the me too movement i mean even everything yeah, that exactly. Kurt cobain did with lgbtq um rights and things like that i mean there, there really weren't a there wasn't a large contingent of mainstream people you know having and I think that that's conversation a, so it's almost like i think that it was misunderstood and mishandled a lot of because of just people didn't want to think it, like they didn't want to it's almost they didn't want to understand correctly and there was some arrogance to it um simply because maybe they didn't agree with what kurt believed in a lot of ways i don't know it, it, you know it's hard it's hard yeah. it's hard once to say. again it's it's a it's, it's, hard it's a difficult say. thing to try to understand when when you weren't there um especially looking back because if i hear something like that now it, it would just be like oh this band is using their platform to talk about an important issue Whereas before, you know, there, as we said, there wasn't a lot of light given to some important issues that Nirvana and a lot of these bands were at the forefront of discussing. So it's really interesting to think about, but it's, you know, it's a great song. It's really, it really came... great. It's, 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 it's once again, it's like what we were talking about, you know, we've spoken about this a lot, but I mean, Kurt was great at writing pop songs and yeah. there's a lot of pop and, you know, as much as this so... is the anti, anti nevermind, there's a lot of pop in here. Well, yeah, and say, and like I said, this is just a killer like song in general. Yes. Like if you you know disregard what the lyrics are, like mm. if you were in it, you know, if you didn't know what it meant, and um, it's also interesting that this came on, you know, in utero after they made it, you know, commercially big in a way. So it's like, um, it's not like their first one when they didn't have pressures from the public or something like. You know, this is right. when everybody had, was consuming their albums and stuff. So it all, you know, it's it's. It's an interesting landscape, and I, I think that yeah. I think you made a good point earlier. Like Kurt was very deliberate in, I think this album and in, in the way that he packaged it, the way that he wrote the lyrics and the the titles and the subjects very for calculated. all this stuff. Yeah, I mean, the, like the B sides are it, all the like it's just very, yeah, anatomical or anatomy or whatever. It's it's yeah. just very it's interesting. Just all, it's it's all a lot more deliberate, I think, than people tend to give give kurt credit for certainly um and then you know after rape me we have francis farmer and and i was just talking <laughs> to you before we got on i forgot how much i like this song you know i'm not yeah. a, i'm not a huge nirvana fan and it's been a while since i've listened to this song it fucking rocks it's just yeah. you know in, in, in the background was... once again it's about francis farmer who was an actress in the in the early to you know mid 19 uh, <laughs> 1930s 40s 50s 60s and so on and she was civilly committed actually and and fun fact uh at kurt and courtney love's wedding courtney love wore a dress that belonged to francis farmer um and this is just one that it just sounds great and you know that line that just hit me again today i miss the comfort in being sad yeah so it's it's so true. Misery loves company. It's it's one of those things where you hear it and you're like, well, if you if you've been sad before like that, you understand. Or right? it's like <laughs> there is there is a strange comfort in the down times and um, yeah, to put it in a song and the way and highlight it like that is I don't know. It's a it's a very you know it's an inside look you know to Kurt. It's a very important lyric. I think it's actually it's very good. Certainly. Yeah, and then and then you know, following that, uh, we have Dumb, and and for me, Dumb is is kind of a member of a a trifecta that I've contrived in my mind from this album with Serve the Servants, Dumb, and All Apologies, just kind of talking about um, societal expectations and you know what ought to make you happy, and 
you know, this song is, you know, I'm not like them, but I can pretend, you know, that really sticks out to me. And, you know, they had asked Kurt in 1993 in a Melody Maker interview, you know, what's this about? Um, you know, and he basically just said that the song is about people who are easily amused, people who, you know, aren't capable of progressing their intelligence, but they're totally happy, as he said, watching 10 hours of television and really enjoying it. I've met a lot of dumb people. They have a shitty job. They may be totally lonely. They don't have a girlfriend. They don't have much of a social life. And yet, for some reason, they're happy. And then the interviewer asked them, you know, asked Kurt, are you envious of that? And he said, at times, I wish I could take a pill that would allow me to be amused by television and just enjoy the simple things instead of being so judgmental and expecting real good quality instead of shit. And just using the word happy, I thought there was a nice twist on the negative stuff we've done before. That's important. This is an important That's quintessential Kurt right there. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's that's golden. I think I think we've talked about it. Sometimes, you know, that it's like analysis, you know, paralysis by analysis. When you you're a little over, it would be yeah, it's, it, it, you're kind of jealous of the the simpleness behind um, being happy and yeah. yeah. Sometimes and, and how, you challenge, yeah, just, challenge yourself it, to not be so uh, analytical, consumed. In a way. Yeah, consumed by everything, by, by those things. That's a great quote. That's you know, that's a good. Yeah, and, and another line in here that has fucked me up at times is the sun is gone, but I have a light. And, you know, on a level, the sun and, and, and a light in your room, you know, fundamentally are the same thing, but one of them's artificial. And I think that relates to a lot of these things that I think he's talking about that bring people happiness and, you know, bring people contentment in their lives, you know, with their relationships and the quality of people they might associate with and the things that they do for recreation. And it's just... There's so much that's artificial out there, and that's one that I've thought about a lot. Where it's, you know, there's still something there, but it's it's the question, you know, is the artificial thing better than just having nothing? You know, if I can't have the real thing, should I have an artificial thing or should I just have nothing? And I think Kurt, at a lot of times, would have just preferred maybe to, to have just had nothing. Yeah, yeah, he'd rather not find something to take its place, even if you know. Even if for a little bit it would be lighter, it wouldn't be real, and then it's not it's not worth it. That's probably why he doesn't want to watch television for 10 hours. <laughs> even I don't, don't want to watch television for 10 hours either, unless it's the Grunge Bible podcast on YouTube. <laughs> no, I don't want to watch that either. I can't, I can't, I can't watch any of our stuff, man. We're probably, we're, <laughs> I can't do it. Dude, we're up to, you know, if you think about it, at least 45 hours of video. Just, That's just a say, lot. Speaking of saying, which, this is going to be a really weird segue, but I have to like talk about it. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you you have no idea where I'm going with this. I mean, this, we need we go. need a we need a little break in the uh, in the action yeah. anyway. So we're this, going to side B after do. this. So apparently, Bono just did an interview uh, <laughs> today or a couple of days ago or whatever. Hell yeah. And, and he basically said he was just like, I can't even listen to the music that we put out before. I'm a terrible singer, and I'm embarrassed by everything we did, and I hate the name of our band. And in a way, <laughs> like he, yeah, he just what? dropped a bomb on everybody. He's like, I fucking hate this stuff. Now, bear in mind, this is the man that put an album of, of, of his bands on everybody's iPod Touch and iPhone back in like 2011, 2012. Right. But he said, he's like, yeah, everybody shit a brick about. That are- yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember that. It was Songs of Innocence. He just yeah. woke up one day and it was on there. Um, but I kind of, you know, it's kind of tied in a little bit, you know, with, with this and you know crazy. certain things not doing it for you. But even just with what I just said earlier about going back and watching our podcast, like, I don't want to watch that. It's kind of, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not embarrassed by it, but I just, I don't, I don't think I was good then. And who knows? I think I'm good now, but I know probably 30 episodes from now, I think I'll be terrible at this point. So I don't know. I think that's a natural reaction that everybody uh, has. I think you'd be a little bit more uh, impressed by yourself if you went back and listened. I'm hoping maybe, the, you know, the first three Hope or five. So. I haven't done it, so. <laughs> I haven't either. I mean, it, uh, you know, usually, yeah, no, we record them so we don't. You know, need right. to why why to would him. I listen to the conversations when I like I already Bad had thing. them? You know, yeah. everything I mean, has we been do, said. But <laughs> in the words of Kurt, uh, everything has been said. Words we'll, we're gonna, suck. We'll, we'll be happy to have the archives. Obviously, it, I think so a, too. I'll, I'll show my you know, children. It's a body of. It's a body. We're almost <laughs> at a year, Chris. Did you know that? 
It's a long time. It's a nice, uh, nice postmortem of our lives to this point. Um, Ethan, I have to say before we get into in utero a little deeper, the back half of this album is a little bit of a blind spot for me. Now, I think in the first episode, here I am calling back to the first episode. You know, we said that we're not experts. We're not, um, you know, the end all be all for a lot of this stuff. And for me. Nirvana in totality is a little bit of a blind spot, particularly a lot of these songs here. I mean, you've got Very Ape, Milk It, Radio Friendly, Unit Shifter, Tourette's. I mean, some of these songs are not songs that I've almost ever listened with intent to. Uh, And today, in a lot of ways, was my first time. And, you know, just some of those thoughts on some of these songs. I mean, there's still that punk element, you know, to a lot of these, a lot of these songs. Like, I heard Very Ape and, you know, it sounds punky to me. It sounds like it's almost a callback to some of the things they did. And it's, it's weird. Like as much as you want to change who you are artistically, there's still going to be some of the structural framework. I think of what made you and what honed you and what your influences were. So I can still kind of hear some of the influences that Kurt may have had on bleach, you know, in a song like very ape. Um, now Absolutely. it's, yeah, it's funny. I say that and then you get to milk it. And for me, you know, when I, when I heard that today, I kind of thought, you know, this is what I would have envisioned a fourth Nirvana album sounding like. You know, if they had had the opportunity to go back in after in utero and create something, I think that this might have been an area that they would have explored a little bit. Uh, And some of the lyrics here are really, really fantastic. Um, The one that stuck out to me was, I'm my own parasite, I don't need a host to live. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, that's another, another one that's, you know, right up there with Kurt and, and a lot of the things that he would say, but, uh, you know, it's got that, you know, soft, um, soft verse, loud chorus, soft verse, loud chorus type thing going on. And, and that's something that I think Kurt and the band were experimenting with a lot throughout pretty much all of their discography. And this is another example of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a very, it, it, it flows through and through for all their albums and, um, they're good at it, you know. I mean, it's like they have that simple, in a way, simple um, structure with, um, you know, Kurt and the drums, and and then being like low, and then coming in really hot, and um, you know, it works. And I think I think that we all, you know, at first for a while, I didn't. I it's almost like, you know, D- Dave's drumming is not. You know, Dave's. I never, at first I didn't think Dave's drumming was super. It's not co- very complex on the album, but um, right. he just does everything really, ex- you know, extremely well and, and plays just like it's just perfect for the type of music they have. I don't know how else to put it because um, mm-hmm. it's not it's nothing crazy like when you go to play their music, um, but it just it is it is Nirvana and and yeah, you're right that you know Milk It and then you know just the second half of this album it just. It fits the framework of, you know, in, you know the se- be the second half of in utero. Yeah, you know, in, in a way. and that's the thing. You made a really good point about Dave's drumming, and I think there's a there's a section of music Instagram and music social media that equates simplicity with being bad, and right. a lot of Dave's drumming and even a lot of Kurt's guitar playing, I think, is the um, you know antithesis of that theory, where it's like a lot of what Kurt did on the guitar and a lot of what dave's drumming was sure it might it might not have been you know neil pert on the drums for rush but i mean there was a lot of intent to it and it might have been simple but it was it was damn good and And i think um yeah um um, a good i think like i said when i first started listening to nirvana like obviously foo fighters is also a band so i had the whole uh, realization that dave grohl is the lead singer foo fighters and then and so Blew I'm your mind. Yeah, so I'm listening to Nirvana and Foo Fighters at the same time. Dave Grohl's playing both instruments. And then I'm also listening to Taylor Hawkins on the drums for Foo Fighters, who is yeah. phenomenal and just plays just these, he's just like phenomenal. And I'm like, dude, he blows Dave out of the water. But then I was like, hold on, I need to take a step back because, well, one, I've Dave, Dave can do all of that stuff too. He just doesn't in a lot of these, um, in a lot of that Nirvana songs. Um, and it's just, I think that's, you know, that's just, you know, I don't want to talk about Dave Grohl too much, even though his birthday just passed. Happy birthday. I just, want to. Just turned 53. <laughs> that's but, the uh, thing, though. You made a good point. Like, just, just because they don't doesn't mean that they can't. 
Yeah, and and I think that's why Dave Grohl is so successful because you know we talked about we talked about this with Lederman, you know, serving the song. Jerry Cantrell, his solo served the song. You know, Dave Grohl serves the music, and there's a reason that he's so successful everywhere he goes, and it's because he knows what the band needs, and he knew what Nirvana needed. Uh, you know, when he was a young man, like he he knew it needed loud drums. It needed to be, you know. It needed to be strike striking, and it needed to happen fast, and then you need to back off and let Kurt. Like he just knew, and I don't know how else to say it. And he knows, what, you know, the Foo Fighters that he did. He just he just knows what the songs need, and I think that is absolutely incredible. And you know, incredible. So, and that um, knowledge of of knowing what a song needs and knowing what an album needs is a skill and it is a skill that is just as valuable and just as important as being able to shred or being able to play ridiculous oh, drum patterns. Yeah. It's it's just as important because if you don't know what the song needs, it's not going to be cohesive and it's probably not going to sound good. It's not going to sound like the pieces fit together. It's almost more important, you know, it's more important yeah. than... It's like if you don't have that, it's you, like you got to be able to walk before you can run. Yeah, if you can't play with, if you can't play with other people and make it sound good, then, you know... It's not going to be unless you're like you know a piano player. They can play solo, but oh, we got some piano slander on the Grunge Bible podcast. <laughs> no, no, not slander. Those guys, those guys can handle their own by themselves. <laughs> you can go watch a you know a man play the piano. I don't know. I, mean, I guess you can go watch a good acoustic guitar the whole time. But anyway, back to Euro. We'll finish up. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. Do you have any? Do you have any burning thoughts on the last few songs other than what yeah, we just got, said? Yeah, I've got a couple here. Um, yeah. So the next one after that would be Penny Royalty. And yeah, for me, I, I can't think of that without thinking of the solo unplugged version. Yeah. Um, you know, of, of Kurt taking care of that. And I took one look and one listen today uh, to the lyrics and to the song, and I can't even begin to dissect the lyrics. I don't know what they mean, but I know they're important. Um, it's another example of hearing words put together in a pattern and being affected by them but not being able to articulate how you're affected by them or what part of you it is affecting um, but this is another one that you know kind of harkens back to just great great pop songwriting and Kurt had said um, the original Steve Albini mix he wasn't particularly satisfied with it because he felt that he had written a really good song and a really good single and he didn't think that I, you know, their work in the studio and the mix of it uh, allowed that quality to shine through, uh, and and looking back, listening to you know the Albini mix, I could kind of hear that a little bit, but there's definitely um, you know being preferential to the unplugged version, but also going back and listening to the album version, which sounds like a single. It sounds like you know there's something there that is a single. Mm-hmm. I totally agree with him, and and it's another one that is much of a shift change as this album was. There's still that structural framework, and there's still that songwriting pattern and in just instinct i think that kurt had to write music and 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 that the band had to make popular music so i'm throwing i'm throwing in a question oh shit yeah i'm spitballing here so you know and we don't like to rank people but so where do we like where do you rank kurt as a songwriter right like so he has this innate like yeah, where does he where does he rank? Like, is he is he one of the best songwriters of all time? Is that is that you know is that possible to say? I think would he's you, one of the best argue? of the era. Definitely, he's best totally of the one 90s? of the best of the era. And when you say yeah, like, I I definitely think he's top five. I really do. Uh, and this is coming from somebody who, like I said, is not the biggest fan of Nirvana. I like Nirvana. I don't yeah. know that I would say well, that I, I love think, Nirvana, but it's it's good. And I think what this it sounds like with this with this album did for you and i don't you know i don't want to put words in your mouth but like uh <laughs> you know it's one of those things where you just re- yeah you're kind of like you re- you really like oh wow you know kurt you understand kurt's writing a lot more just by listening it full fully through and there's like this deep admiration that you know not that you didn't have before but i mean i had the same thing i listened to it and you're just like wow like complete complete work to me complete work of art it's like kind of when we like dissected core you know, you get to the end of it. We get to the end of it. We're just like, damn, you know, these guys knew what they were doing. <laughs> Believe yeah. it or not, they know what they're doing. Like, and it was so intentional, too. Yeah. It wasn't, we need to nail the chorus on Penny Royalty. Yeah. It's, we need to nail this album from the first song to the last song. It's going to be presented in a way that tells a story and it has a message. It has a bunch of messages. But you can't, 
you know, you can't have one ingredient of the meal without the other, you know, the other eight, just as you can't have one of these songs, I think, without the other 11. Yeah. Um, and that's something that anytime you listen to music or you listen to a new release, you have to listen to it front to back and you can't shuffle, you can't skip because you might not like the fifth song or whatever, but it's going to enhance your understanding and enhance the reception yeah. of the eighth song or the 12th song. Just like you, just like you opened up this pod with the serve the servants like the intentional was it intentional to be the first song the first lyric like yeah yeah it probably it, it definitely was like there was a there's a you know people don't just pick a, uh, you know a, an opener to the concert randomly they don't just throw a dart at the they don't they don't close this concert with a dart same thing with an album so you know yeah. why, why wouldn't you be intentional on um, that's the thing I, I i don't buy the notion that anything that this band did was by accident yeah yeah I really Kurt wanted don't. to get big. Kurt wanted I, I to be think, famous. I think he did. I think he wanted to be famous. And you know, once you yeah. get there, there's obviously things that I don't think you can relate to. You know, until you're there, and then you're left with your own devices to deal with them. Yeah. As I think, you know, Kurt had fully discovered by the time he was in the studio creating in utero, uh, along with the rest of the band. And um, yeah, it's really, really interesting to think about. And you know, as we come to the close of this album, we have Radio Friendly, Unit Shifter, and Tourette's before we get to All Apologies and. Radio Friendly, Unit Shifter, and Tourette's are kind of back to that notion of it being the anti-nevermind in my mind. Um, you know, it's just noise, and it's it seems like a very conscious choice to circumvent and to change the strategy and to change the uh, presentation right here. I mean, you get a lot of noise, um, and it just it, it sounds different. It really sounds different, and I think back to what it would have been like to put this CD in you know in in september october of 1993 and you get to these songs and you know wow like this is nirvana this is you know this is dave chris and kurt going at it yeah i mean it's i think they accomplished exactly what they wanted i mean this is this is not never mind this is its own thing and i think it it should be remembered for that i mean it's it's a great piece of art and um you know, maybe maybe people need to listen to this album a little uh, f- fully through uh, more often, uh, like we did today. I think that we're both, like, you know, coming across a lot more appreciation. I mean, there's a lot of you know really noticeable songs, like the last song in this album. I mean, to end with all apologies. Um, this is obviously was done at the M- MTV Unplugged, and this is one that you hear on the radio a lot, and this is. This is a, this is one of their quintessential songs. I mean, this is there's no way around it. This is a great. Let's see. Let yeah, the, and and this is um, for me at least, this is the song that I think of when I think of Kurt Cobain. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't. I'm I'm not I'm not quite sure why, but I do know that there was a time where, um, I was watching a special on Nirvana or something to that effect, and when they got to the point that he had passed away, this is a song that they played. <laughs> Um, you know, dubbed over some some footage of Kurt and everything, and and I don't know. I, as I was saying all along, this is kind of a callback, I think, to Dumb and to Serve the Servants, and they have that line yep. in there: "I wish I was like you, easily amused." And that lyric has a home in Serve the Servants, just as it has a home in Dumb. I mean, they're talking about the same things, and for me, kind of the most striking part of this song is the, you know couple of things but the acoustic guitar licks at the beginning and in in, in in that pattern there but then how it ends all in all is all we are it's another one of those lyrics that it's hard to explain what it means and it's hard to explain its importance to myself personally but it just kind of affects me in a way i don't know absolutely i mean it's one of those things where i i totally understand what you're saying when it say it affects you you just i think that it's important that he you know repeats it at the end of the song for you know repetition is is really important in songwriting and in anything and i think that it's it just kind of lingers you know at the end of the song at the end of the album you know the whole thing yeah yeah i i totally agree and and i don't know it might just be a thing that I personally do believe that whoever you are at the surface and whoever you present yourself as to other people is exactly who you are. So it's an encapsulation of, of, of what you are and who you are. It's it's how you act and how you treat people. And 
and and that's what I've always gathered from it. But I mean, if you're talking about important lyrics to start and end this album, I mean, with with "Serve the Servants" and then with "All Apologies," um, you couldn't pick two better songs, in my opinion, to start and finish um, what turned out to be the final studio album that Nirvana gave us. Yeah, it's it's great. And then later we got you know we also have the B sides, which we won't spend an incredible amount of time on. Um, but it does have a really great song that I do love. So just going through the, you know, because there's a there's a few interesting things like in, in utero B sides they have you know marigold, uh, moist vagina, gallons of rubbing alcohol flow through the strip, I hate myself and want to die, uh, which appeared on the Beavis and Butthead Experience compilation, which I thought was and that's awesome. the most important part of this and show, the, obviously. And yeah, and that was I say, and that's why we're doing this episode. Um, I know that the um, the gallons of uh, rubbing alcohol has like 20 minutes of silence on like the, isn't it like, it's just like, uh, it's a yeah, it was track. A bonus, it it just, was a bonus hidden track on some of the releases of it. There was, after all apologies, there was 20 yeah. minutes of nothing. And then this song came in. It's just a yeah. rambling mess. It's right. an unfinished song and it's just, it's just a total mess, but it's exactly what you expect from Nirvana. Just because it's yeah. a mess doesn't mean it was unintentional. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that's such a, um, I love that shit, you know, 20 minutes of silence and then more stuff. And it's just such a, it's I always like, love you know, the, the end, little end Easter of a, eggs there. Yeah. It's like the end of a movie. And, um, but Marigold is one of the songs that I, I really like because actually, um, you know, the Foo Fighters, they do a version of that on their, uh, Skin and Bones album, which is one of my favorite albums of theirs to listen to. It's a live performance and they go through, um, a lot of stuff that they don't have on other albums, but some, you know, some other stuff that they do. And, um, they play it like, so you know the the Nirvana, um, it's very it's very bare bones like you know and the whole B side is the whole B side is like kind of just kind of curt like softly singing and soft soft guitars it seems like um, and that's a lot what Marigold was but then they really they really live the Foo Fighters really liven it up with like some orchestra and I just think that seeing those two you know those two the two versions next to each other is is um, you know, I mean, maybe because the title is Marigold and it's a flower and you can see maybe, you know, there's some symbolism and how it's, you know, watered and, you know, aged and stuff. I don't know if you want to make some parallels, but it's just cool. I love, I love that he took that and kind of did that. And, uh, yeah, wasn't it, it, wasn't it also, um, there was some, uh, possibility of them doing it at the end of Unplugged. If I'm not mistaken, I th- I think so. And then, then they were it didn't go- happen after after they covered Lead Belly's "Where Did You Sleep Last Night." There was nowhere else to go. They were um, like, "You should go back and do it." And Kurt was like, "No," because like, I think there's Marigold, nothing else that can be done after that. Else. You can't top that, which is there's a really, nothing. really, really impressive moment. And and that's one of the performances from the grunge era that still kind of gives me chills when I watch it. And that look in Kurt's eyes and. Kind of speaking about the B-sides in, in the demos, that's that's some of Nirvana's most fascinating work for me are some of the demos and some of the B-sides. And, you know, it's it's more unpolished, obviously, because, you know, they haven't been recorded properly and they haven't been mixed, they haven't been mastered or anything like that. But it's just kind of uh, unadulterated Nirvana and the songwriting is just so, so bare there. So it's always, I always love kind of mining for some of the the demos of different bands and i've spent a lot of my time listening to pearl jam demos for example or Soundgarden demos and and nirvana demos as well um and you know as as time goes on and you know these albums are re-released for the 25th 30th anniversaries a lot of these bands have been releasing demos or unreleased versions of different songs alternative versions and that's kind of the stuff that i I can really appreciate, I really get into when that happens. And, uh, you know, that happened when they re-released In Utero for the 25th anniversary. Um, We were able to hear a lot of these songs. And like we were saying about Marigold, that has the distinction of being the only song uh, recorded and released by both Nirvana and the Foo Fighters. So that's uh, that's a special song. And and I wonder what it's like for, for Dave to play that. Yeah, that's like, I mean, they don't, they don't play, he doesn't play any of, nirvana stuff really except for probably that song and i know he's yeah. he's known that they always want him to play stuff he doesn't teen spirit you know yeah. once every four years or whatever but 
Yeah, it's really interesting. Now, Ethan, what what do you think? Do you think that you know had Kurt had had Kurt not passed away, do you think we would have gotten a fourth Nirvana album? Do you think the band would have broken up, or do you think it may have been a few years and the band broke up and then got back together? That's kind of the stuff that there's there's no answer to it, but it's always fascinating for me to think about. Yeah, it's the only other option. I think that Kurt would have you know, one million percent continued making music. So the question is, would he went would he have gone solo at some point or would he have stayed with um, you know, the members and making music and um I think that I I don't know, it's tough. I, I think that he I think that we would have got more Nirvana albums. Um and then I think maybe eventually he would I don't know if he would separate entirely and do his own thing, but um, I, I do think that Kurt would have wanted to explore, like just him recording and and maybe you know maybe even you know mixing his own stuff and just being like you know I tried you know I learned a little bit what I could and and this is what I got and you know who knows what kind of and you know you don't know if what if Dave you know would have wanted to start his own band you know I don't know if if everything kind of kick started him to want to be in a band or right. if that would happen anyway you know maybe he would have been like man i need to get out from behind the drums i think i have a voice that i want to so you know there's that side to it would he have left um what do you think i don't know um i, I know after in utero was released kurt said in, in in a few different interviews that he was out of material and what was on <laughs> in utero was it and and he had said that I don't have anything else. This is what I have. I'm really nervous about what's next uh, because they're going to want more Nirvana and I just don't have any songs written. And of course, I do think, you know, Kurt was an artist and artists create art. And I think in some way, shape or form, there would have been more music to come. I think there would have been at least one more Nirvana album. And I do think that something, something would have come from Kurt um, detached from Nirvana as a solo artist or maybe collaborating with different individuals. Um, But I mean, who's to say, and that's, that's the, that's one of the, one of the sad points, you know, when someone passes before their time, there's a lot of, a lot of creativity, a lot of art that didn't make its way into the world because that opportunity was never, uh, it never occurred. Yeah, it's it's always interesting thinking about the uh, the alternate um, the what ifs. You know, realities. Yeah, the what ifs, the uh, and all that stuff, and you know that's what keeps us coming back. The basically the what ifs, and and that's yeah, that's why we adore a lot of it. But then also, it's why we enjoy the stuff that we do have and the stuff that has you know lasted the lasted the. I don't know, tale of time or the what, test, of time. test of time. Still the here, here we time. are yeah, talking exactly. about it in utero. But um, similar to the, uh, the the Stone Temple Pilots core episode that we did, you know, I, I do walk away from listening today and, and talking about it with you with a different perspective and, and appreciation of different parts that I may not have noticed. But uh, you know, it does in utero does remain my my favorite release from Nirvana, and I, I don't know that that's ever going to change. Um, just a fantastic album. And we will leave you with that. That is <laughs> In Utero, Chris's favorite album. Yep. By Book Nirvana. it. Take it to the bank, Book boys it. and girls, ladies and gents. Um, this was a lot of fun. That was excellent. Um, so, such such a great album, and I'm, I'm really happy that uh, we were to talk about it. That was that was great, Chris. There's a lot of good insight. Um, it's a good one. You know, it's not it's not hard when there's it's good art. You know what I mean? I think that. I think I come back to that a lot of times when when you have a, when when you listen to something and you're kind of affected by it. I like I just like looking at it as art, and um, like we talked about with the core album, like it's just a good piece of art. It's fi- it's well thought out and it's it and it's kind of um, you know delivered correctly and and kind of finished. And that's how I feel with this one. I just think that it's a really you know we got artists, we got great art, and we should be happy for it. And I'm glad that we can celebrate it today. I certainly am too. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, um, I guess moving on to the next thing. Um, I mean, we got song of the week coming down the hatch in a little bit. 
Um, is there any anything that we need to bring up and maybe breadcrumb? I mean, we got some things on yeah, the pipe. We can, we, I'm we, trying we, to think if we can can we give him anything. We, we can we can we can breadcrumb the fact that we're working on a few things, and I know we've probably been saying that for half of the duration of this entire podcast. You know, probably for the last five or six months we've been saying it, but we're closer than we've ever been. We're uh, closer to than we've ever uh, been doing some doing some cool things, partnering on some cool things with some cool individuals. Uh, hopefully having their voices join us here um, and and having them to interview and to discuss certain things with. We're, we're hoping to and we're planning currently to have some individuals who were there when it happened uh, who are also, in a way, Ethan, making it happen themselves at that time. Yeah. Um, yeah, so within the coming months, uh, we're hoping to have some special guests on here that I, I think you'll appreciate and you'll enjoy. I think yeah, that, that is, are the, are the, is that enough of a breadcrumb? I don't think we can say anything else. No, I think that's perfect. I think that we're going to get the we're going to get the side to the story that we always wanted. I mean, straight I will from say, the horse's mouth. Yeah, uh, but to, you know, to be completely honest, you know, I mean, I messaged Dave Grohl and I was let. We were, I think, we were left on red. I, I, think yeah, I, I don't it. think Dave Grohl opened our <laughs> message. No, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> but uh we're shooting shots left and right so something something's gonna hit here soon right you just gotta send it exactly oh man so um song of the week so have you been listening to some good music chris i actually have a lot of songs that were kind of fighting for this song of the week i had a had a late entry that was released today that i was like oh man i oh, i could man. absolutely i actually shared it on porch radio um there's a few other songs but i did narrow it down i kept it within the I kept it within kind of, uh, I don't know. I think I was listening to Primus Radio. I've been listening to Primus Radio the last few days. You have been. Days. You've been, you've been hammering the Primus. <laughs> Dude, when, so I, obviously I, I work at a tree, tree service company, so I cut cut wood, pick up sticks, you know, depending on the day. And um, so I was doing a lot of, when you're outside and it's cold or not, I mean, that's what brings us to grunge rock. And, man, I feel so connected to this genre right now. I feel so connected to these bands you know, primus and alice in chains it feels good i mean not you know we're always connected to them but you know i feel really feel really i feel really close to les claypool more closer than i've ever felt <laughs> he's our pal he's with uh, us so, everywhere all the time so how about you chris have you been listening to some good music or where have you fallen these last you know couple days oh i've been listening to some good music all right and and i have to say uh i'm willing to make the statement and I believe this statement, which is why I'm saying it, that this is the most um, contended for song of the week spot out of the entire podcast for me. There's yeah. there's a lot there's a lot of good music in the hopper right now. And, and to this point, as I'm speaking these words, I'm still conflicted. And I'm not entirely sure what my song of the week is going to be out of the three or four that are in my head. I I am... I'm I'm in a similar spot, you know, and the, the thing is, we have to choose, and we have we're actually, to. <laughs> we're, co- we're going to the point where we're on the so clock. The nice, you know what? The nice part is, we can all, you can always push, you know. We, but when you push a song to the next week, you never know what you're going to listen. It's to. It's not the, the same next, the next week. I was going to say because I listen to songs, and all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, I need to talk about this. So like, mm-hmm. you know, they might miss their window. I might not come back and, and this, put that's this happened on the list. to me before. I've had some so, some second and third place winners that have never made it on there. But uh, you so know this what? is important. This is actually critical because we i think we're both in a similar spot um yes do you want to go first you want me to i'll go first i'm i'm ready to to make a selection all right um, drum roll please everybody here we go uh the the buzzer beater victory for episode 45 song of the week uh this is a band that uh we were speaking about a few nights ago ethan and uh oh yeah you're you're really excited that i've been uh getting into them a little bit i think an awakening is on the horizon and uh i'm soon going to be thrown into the deep end of this band and, and grow to appreciate them in a new and important light but that is from the band built to spill um mm-hmm. i i've never really listened to them beyond i guess carry the zero which i think is their most uh, commercially successful song but i stumbled upon their 1996 album the normal years and uh, I stumbled onto that album by way of they did a cover of Daniel Johnston's Some Things Last a Long Time, which I've been listening to a lot lately. I actually just learned how to play it on the guitar before we uh, hopped on to record this. But Incredible. that is not my song of the week. My song of the week is the last song on that album. 
and it's called Terrible Perfect. And uh, I think I was texting you when I first heard it, and it sounds like this weird love child of American football and early Modest Mouse in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just really, really, really great music, and the lyrics are great. Uh, I'm a big lyrics guy, as I think we all know at this point in time, and this one's got it all. It's got some great lyrics that get you thinking. Uh, it's got some really, really unique guitar that reminds me of Modest Mouse in a way, and uh, it's just a really, really complete song. And um, yeah, it's funny. I never heard this record before, and it's you know it's 25, 26 years old, and here I am experiencing it for the first time. So that's that's the great part. That's what keep you, keeps you coming back to music. That's yeah. This is important. This is an important awakening. Uh, I love. I love uh, Built to Spill. It's another one that um, I got into Modest Mouse, and then I had talked to some people that loved Modest Mouse, and they're like, "You need to listen to Built to Spill." And I was like, it's been the "Same Say thing." No more. Like, yeah, I was like, "Okay." And I listened to him, like, "Oh my gosh!" And I'm like, "These guys, you know, there's such an influence on Isaac Brock." And uh, yeah, that's a it's a good it's you you know you're not, you're gonna get you know one of the pioneers of, of, of a lot of the music that we listened to uh, you know the last 10 years more modern stuff you know built this bill was very um you know, pixies and stuff you know those guys are so influential in, in a in a specific way and you know something that is i find really interesting um I that's agree. awesome yeah good good call great call um, thank you so my song of the week so i'm gonna <laughs> Chris, I'll give you a hundred dollars if you can guess what band this, I'm gonna pick. It's, you probably do, won't pick what it. Do so. I, what do I stand to lose if I don't pick it correctly? Do I'll I lose you, $100? I will give you. I'll give you. What do you stand to lose? Uh, nothing. All right. So you here? Yeah, you got a hundred to zero odds. Um, it's a four-letter word. I'm, yeah, it's a four-letter word. It's the band. I, I, I'll give you the first letter, and you probably. You know, well, I know it's not it, Primus maybe. then, because Primus is five. Right. Is it no? <laughs> Primus is six letters. <laughs> oh God! I turned out I was alive. My math is correct. <laughs> My math was not correct. All right. The first letter is W. I was gonna guess sponge, but sponge is also. Awesome. I, <laughs> sponge you're getting is six close. Letters, you're, you're you're within the realm of. Uh, so I, I'm wondering if if um if the listeners out there, I wonder if you guys know what it is. Four letters starts with W. Oh man, I have to say, I, I get pretty nervous when people ask me to do yeah. math on the spot. So I'm I'm gonna forfeit I don't my think choice. It's all good. I don't I don't think that you have um. A it's much not of ween, a list. right? It is ween. It's a ween. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. Yes, I was gonna Go. say I don't. There's probably not. I was gonna say I don't know if you have any listening history with this band, but it is ween. There's um, one ween song I know. I can't remember the name of it. Let's 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 hear your song from Ween though. This, this, is, song? this is great. Is, is it was on it came it popped up on my uh, Primus radio I'm, I'm pretty sure and it was yep. um this the song is the mollusk and okay. it's just it has it's not this, like a sea like, creature yeah maybe yeah probably it sounds like I mean you th- maybe you're thinking of mussel but maybe mollusk is also an, an, an underwater creature but it doesn't matter <laughs> um it has this very like trippy like flute kind of like I don't know melody that goes throughout the whole song, and it's so kind of it's pretty you know kind of funky and psychedelic, and and then it has like you know Ween, you know, I think the two guys I think they're they go they like their stage names are what is it Gene and Dean Ween or something like that. <laughs> something, <laughs> that's like, iconic. Like that's, it's not their names, but they go by Gene and Dean Ween, which is kind of cool. So I don't know. It, it's a really it's just a really solid song, and like it's just one that I don't know if it was just time of day that i just loved it but or like you know part of the playlist but i was i was just loving it so um yes i'm gonna go with the ween the mollusk as my song that's amazing i i I need to listen to this because yeah uh, you do you you should check it out for sure chris yeah because the the fact check is i actually know two songs by ween i know tried and true as well as bananas and blow (laughs) bananas Um, and blow baby (laughs) it's a it's a time time tested combo those i said that to you the other day right you did that's the only reason i know it yeah (laughs) oh incredible that's just such a that's such a that's yes, a fun, you, you are you are tasked song. with guiding me on my ween journey. I'll I'll do my best. I don't know much, Chris, but I can. Sorry, blind leading the blind. That's okay. Oh man, awesome! Those are good songs. Those are good. Those are two good songs. Um, 
within the era, within the you know, within the genre. Yeah, we're keeping it topical for everybody out there, which we don't do sometimes. Right, but I think that's why people listen as well. So absolutely. That brings us to the end of the podcast. That so is the I end of we'll, the show. We'll do our final words. Um, anybody we need to thank? There's at least one person. Yeah, we need to thank our producer, Drew McFadden, for his steadfast work on this podcast. I mean, that's the thing. Um, as exciting and as proud I am of <laughs> having done 45 episodes every single week, um, I am very, very grateful and proud of drew uh for all of his work because it's we have the easy job as far as i'm concerned of just sitting here and shooting the bullshit about music and not music sometimes i mean he's 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 creating the product he's polishing it and similarly to how we were talking about you know everything that goes into a band releasing a record and all of the mixing and and the producing and and all of that that's a large component of it you know there's a lot that goes into this show and I don't know anything about it, but thankfully for us, Drew does. Exactly. It's so true. It's like, I, it's nice. We finish and we get to, we get to mail it off to him and then he sends a final product and we're like, all right, sweet. It's like that the podcast easy. fairy drops our episode to us and it's all good to go. <clears throat> yeah. We are very thankful to have, have Drew. Um, you rock, but also fuck you. Yeah. Fuck you, Drew. And, uh, so thank you, and uh, thank you to all the listeners. You guys are the real, you know, you guys, if there's a tie for first place, it's between Drew and, and all of our listeners and the, all the Patreon members and supporters. So, yeah, yeah, we just, like, we're just like blessed. It's like a 35-way tie. Yeah. Um, On so how yeah, many listeners we have, too. So keep listening if you're out there. Keep liking and, and commenting and stuff. That you know, that, that stuff goes a long way, uh, believe it or not. It helps us get known on the national and international level, which is where we're trying to rank. We're trying to get top. We're trying to get the number one, right, Chris? Yeah, we're coming. We're coming for number one. Uh, this past week, we we're up to number eleven. Uh, so we need to break that top ten. I think it's coming soon. Top ten in the mu- music commentary, correct? Music Chris? commentary. Yep. Yeah, we were, music we were ranked number eleventh. Yeah, which is pretty damn good, right? I mean, out of it, all the it, podcasts, sound, it sounds cool. <laughs> it sounds awesome. I mean, we're we're right up there with companies who actually sound legit, like Rolling Stone, Amazon Music, Uprocks, the New York Times. So we're 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 in the mix, man. We're rubbing elbows, dude. That's amazing. And feels good to rub elbows. So keep everybody. We're gonna keep doing our job. You keep doing your job of listening. Um, you know, if if you've been listening for a long time, it's time to become a patron. Why not? We got a lot of good shit coming there, and uh, that's it. That's it, baby. That's all I got. That's it. That'll wrap her up. We'll see you all next week for episode 46. Thank you for listening. Uh, Give In Utero a listen front to back. Let us know what you think. Yeah, that's a great... uh, Everybody do their homework. homework. Listen to the album. The first homework assignment of the new year. As soon as this ends, you're going to go and listen to Serve the Servants, and Mm -hmm. you're going to finish it off. Play it loud. Wake up your neighbors. Play it. Yeah. Rock rock and roll, guys. Man, I I love music, Chris. I love music. This is great, man. This is great stuff. Wait. Uh, <laughs> that, that's it. That's, that's it. it. <laughs> Shit, I'm back. This is great, this is great stuff. <laughs> Shit, I'm back. Yeah. yeah, that was really good. That was good. Yeah, Drew, Drew can do whatever he wants at the end, where everyone, yeah, <laughs> where everyone wants to cut that. It don't matter. Yeah, you, he'll be fine. Yeah. <sighs> nice. That was a long one. just it, it sounds different it really sounds different and i think back to what it would have been like to put this cd in you know in in september or october of 1993 and you get to these songs and you know wow like th- this is nirvana this is you know this is dave chris and kurt going at it yeah it's um sorry i'm looking at i'm just looking at the uh, uh fuck <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> I was I was looking at the B sides and I was like, I got distracted. Um, yeah, mark that down. So, uh, what did you do? You were just uh, did you 
What did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I just said that this, it was like, like you, if you listen to this at the time, you'd really realize that it's not never mind. Oh, um, uh, yeah. You could just you say like yeah like I totally agree whatever whatever <laughs> and then and then we could get to all apologies which is the important one. Yeah. Um. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. So just say yeah I totally yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Taking my nicotine out. Incredible. <laughs>